okay um, uh, context. And the second application now is um, a phenomenological approach to the um, describing or modeling strong correlation physics, which started out um, three or so years ago with um, um, influential papers by um, the Santa Barbara group of, of Leon Balance and, and later um, other groups joined in. And the idea here is to, yeah, I, I mentioned it in the very beginning, to turn our usual rationale of thinking about strongly correlated physics upside down, namely um, starting the description of a complex system, with, um, complex fermion correlations from little uh, autonomous cells which we model as ultra strong interacting base models, in other words, as SYK models. And um, then in a second step, to tunnel couple them to form networks, d-dimensional networks. So um, how does this go? Well, we, um, we do the following. We um, formulate in Hamiltonian, that, again, I cannot stress enough, this is, I mean, highly phenomenological and the success of this approach is simply determined by, in terms of the results or the proximity to uh, real physical behavior of real systems um, it is able to predict. But um, on, on, on the this phenomenological basis, we say the following. We start um, with a system of Hamiltonians here of these individual cells. And for them, we model as SYK Hamiltonians. And we can negotiate whether these are complex fermion SYKs or Majorana SYKs for the time being, I concentrate on the Majorana version. So we have um, a set of Majorana operators, Clifford operators um, for each of these cells A, and then we tunnel couple. It's a tunneling operator. And this tunneling operator um, is, well, I mean, should, should be sort of natural. I mean, we sum over nearest neighbors and we model these tunneling bridges in these guys here, as um, uh, bilinear. I mean, and that I think one can argue is the most natural um, tunnel coupling you can think of. I mean, people have thought about more exotic forms of coupling, but this year I think is quite natural. And this being Majorana's, um, these, these are the um, are anti symmetric matrices. And um, to make the whole thing um, Hermitian, we, we add an I up front. And, um, these, um, these bees, the tunneling, everything is, is kind of random here. So it, it makes perfect sense to choose them random as well. So we say that these guys are Gaussian distributed um, independently of the SYK distribution. And here's a scale V squared and this V squared sets the strength of tunneling. Okay. Now um, we follow the same logics as, as before and ask ourselves, um, well, I mean, how something's going on here? How um, maybe relevant or irrelevant? I mean, how important is this type of, of tunneling on the background of our interacting base models? And it is very natural to start this um, analysis, given of what we had before, um, from a mean field perspective. I mean, field in the sense that um, we start out from uh, in a setting where n and n is the, di um, the, the dimension of the single particle Hilbert spaces on our um, on our individual grains. I mean, the n entering the SYK Hamiltonian that n is infinitely large. This is um, clearly where I mean, thinking about real materials, um, a somewhat academic assumption, right? I mean, you. You, you wouldn't like to have a thermodynamically extended cell in here, and I will relax it in a second. But for the time being, let's assume n is inf infinite. So we have infinitely many degrees of freedom on our individual cells. And on that basis, ask how, how important the tunneling is. Now, the one and only thing that is now important is um, to remember that the effective fermion dimension of um, our interacting cells is T inverse one quarter. I mean, this is a non-family liquid dimension. And on that basis, we can ask 
how relevant will now be is a perturbation, the, the tunneling action. And the tunneling action has the architecture, just the raw structure, eta, eta, and then some numbers, some, some potential matrix elements. So what will be its dimension? It is t to the power one um, from the measure. And then we subtract two times one quarter from the fermion operators. And what we see now is that unlike in a Fermi liquid where the fermions would have dimension one half, this here has a residual dimension t to the power one half, which means it is a relevant perturbation. So the um, an important conclusion here is that this SYK two operator, it is um, often called, I mean, this is an, what people in the field call an SYK two interaction, just two fermions instead of four for the interaction operator. This SYK2 operator is RG relevant. And on that basis, you can immediately um, conjecture a phase diagram. Uh, a phase diagram spanned by <clears throat> the tunnel strength um, here, this tunneling strength, and temperature. Temperature um, being representative of the time scale, if you want to uh, probe And the statement is that we should expect a crossover. And that is his um, prediction, central prediction of this uh, paper by the Balance Group 2017. A crossover between two different regimes. Um, in the, for high temperatures, means short time scales. I mean, yeah, yeah, temperature is um, inversely proportional to time, imaginary time. We are essentially dealing with um, isolated network, uh, isolated cells. I mean, assuming that our initial tunnel coupling is weak, this V, there will be a phase at, at high temperatures where we have this non Fermi liquid here, yeah, the isolated SYK cell. And in the parlance, parlance of the field, this is called a strange metal phase. Why strange metal? Um, one thing I did not tell you, and I will not uh, discuss in detail, is that you can actually um, describe the transport properties of um, quantum dots modeled by SYK Hamiltonians. And in particular, you can ask yourself, what are their conduction properties, or maybe thermal conduction properties? And this being a non-Fermi liquid, we have no reason to expect why that this would be normal, the normal conduction of a Fermi liquid. And indeed, um, they have strange metallic behavior. They conduct, but with unusual um, temperature dependence of conductances. The electric conductance for the complex SYK model is linear in, in temperature. And that is indicative of what is called um, strange metal phase in strong correlation physics. But what's more, most important for us is that this is a non Fermi liquid. And then if you now lower temperature, if you, you, you make your tunneling relevant and eventually the tunneling operator will overtake, it will become uh, the most important player. And then you actually generate a Fermi liquid. So what you have then is um, a strong tunnel coupled um, system of, of fermion islands, a Fermi surface will form and you end up in a Fermi liquid. And that's very nice. I mean, the, um, you have a, um, this crossover physics between two phases which are important in strong correlation physics. You get it almost for free. It's a crossover, not a phase transition um, between these two. And um, it should be evident that the, the crossover temperature increases with tunnel strength, right? For very weak tunneling, you have, a low, have to go to low temperatures to see the crossover. Is that halfway clear up to this point? Question? No. Okay. Now um, let's ask ourselves the following question, which um, this is a very relevant question to ask in this context. Where actually is this crossover line? I mean, when does this crossover take place? And um, the answer is um, found as follows. You should simply ask which energy scale, um, I mean, looking at the situation from the perspective of individual Majorana fermions, which of two energy scales is the most important? 
So what we want to compare is the strength of the intrinsic energy scales of the SYK cells. And these are our melon type self energies, which we discussed before. Um, so that's one scale. And um, the scale, I mean, and, and, and um, this is actually temperature dependent. In this context, um, it is uh, cubed of the green function, which we discussed. And the competing energy scale, which describes now the strength of the or perturbation due to tunneling, that's the self energy of the tunneling operator, where this here is this V squared interaction. This is a tunneling self energy, and you can compute both. It's actually not so difficult exercise, an instructive exercise to do this. Um, but comparing these two, you find that there is a the crossover temperature scale, TFL. Temperature enters here um, via these, these scales up here. So as a, as a result of this um, computation, you find that it's given as V squared over J. That's very natural the scale. You know, it's it's like um, think about it as, as, as kind of um, golden rule type uh, perturbation theory. Um, strength of the perturbation V squared over characteristic energy denominator. That, that's a natural scale to expect. And that sets the scale here. And importantly, it's independent of n. It, we are in the n to infinity limit. Okay, so, so far so good. This is um, what you get from this mean field um, approach to the n to infinity um, limit and um, quite encouraging, I should say. Now, the question I would like to address now, what happens for finite n? And this question is, is, is quite relevant. I mean, it's not like we are doing now some small n, finite n corrections or so. Uh, thinking about a realistic, say, strongly correlated cuprate type or heavy fermion material or whatever, whatever strong interaction cells locally you would form, they would certainly contain only a handful of degrees of freedom. Huh? Otherwise, the approach would be academic. So um, it is quite relevant to think about n about lowish values of n, maybe 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2 max. And um, what happens then for finite n, we, something quite entertaining happens actually. Um, then we, we enter a warfare scenario. Um, there, is a, there is a war um, being waged between two players, between our tunneling operator, which we discussed before, and the Goldstone modes we discussed yesterday. And they hate each other, as I will um, explain in the following. And their competition then um, determines um, a much richer phase diagram than what we have discussed so far. And it's very simple to understand, very easy to understand. So um, let's do the following Gedanken experiment. Let's assume that our V, the tunneling, was initially arbitrarily weak, very, very weak. From the perspective of the n to infinity system, it's still relevant, it will grow. But let's now ask what happens for finite n in this situation. And what we saw yesterday is that in the unperturbed system, there is this all important energy scale M inverse or the time scale M, which is linearly proportional in N. I mean, one over J times N essentially. And to remind you, I mean, this M was the time scale beyond which strong quantum fluctuations on the individual SYK cells became important, which are not present in the N2 infinity system. So what happens then? Well, we saw that um, for time scales large compared to N, our green function scaled no longer as T inverse one half, but rather as T inverse minus three halves. This was Liouville universality due to Goldstone mode fluctuations. And on this basis, we conclude that the effective dimension of the Majorana operator in this long time regime is no longer T to the minus one quarter, but T to the minus three quarters. Two Majoranas make one green function, yeah? And now we can ask again, how relevant is this funding operator in this long time regime? And what we, have is again the same 
tunneling operator to look at. And we do our dimension counting again. So it's one dimension from the integral over time, but now we have minus two times three quarter. And that is T inverse one half. And we realize that um, the tunneling operator has now become RG irrelevant. RG irrelevant. The physics here is, I mean, um, roughly, that in this long time regime, our individual dots here, they are subject to very, very strong quantum fluctuations. And these fluctuations do a very good job at fluctuating the tunnel couplings away. So they, they kill off the tunnel couplings. And that means that we have now um, a serious competition um, going on. And we should expect two principal different scenarios. I mean, two, two options are possible yeah, in this uh, situation. The first is um, what we discussed more or less before. So either way, we come from a strange metal we come down there, lowering temperature. And <clears throat> um, what may happen is that initially our N is our N is in some sense very large, so that this Ehrenfest temperature, which we have here, which is um, the inverse of the Ehrenfest time, and um, inversely proportional in N. That is very low. I mean, we have very, very large N. And in this case, the crossover temperature here, which we discussed before, this one uh, will be larger than this scale. So here we have our family liquid crossover temperature. And in this case, the following happens. We come from the strange metal phase. Um, we then turn via this um, balance a crossover into a Fermi liquid. And under Fermi liquid condition, our conformal symmetry is strongly explicitly broken. The Goldstone modes will never form. And we essentially have the same crossover as discussed above. But then there is um, the complementary scenario where our tunneling is initially weak so that the Fermi liquid, oops, at the Fermi liquid temperature is quite low. And N is actually not so small, so that the Ehrenfest temperature, inverse of the Ehrenfest time, is larger. And in this case, we, again, coming from strange metal phase, um, the Goldstone modes form, and they kill off the tunneling. And we end up in a totally different phase. And what phase will we end up? We will actually end in an insulating phase. I mean, really insulating um, from a conduction property point of view, because um, the Goldstone modes now kill the tunneling, and we have we're dealing with isolated cells. And um, the upshot of this is that we actually have a quantum phase transition. We have a, a quantum phase transition. Um, and this was for the first time noticed in a paper by um, Feigelman and Lumkin that was in 18. <clears throat> and the phase transition for fixed N forms as, um, as a function or the, the, the relevant parameter is a tunneling strength. And it turns out that the dimensionless parameter in which we want to measure this um, is, I mean, n must enter. Uh, clearly, for n to infinity, um, this um, guy goes to 0. Actually, the way um, squared. And um, the phase transition is now between the following uh, phases for, um, for if, if this parameter is, is very large, if n is large, um, I will have, I end up in a Fermi liquid. And otherwise, I end up in an insulator. And this is really now a phase transition. And above that, I have a quantum critical regime. So 
um, we have the same, we have such a phase diagram. And here we have a strange metal phase. So um, the, the, the space diagram can be established uh, from a, um, a randomization group approach, which I mean, what I discussed so far was essentially some scaling arguments, but you can develop a, a full blown RG approach. And we did that in a 2019 paper. But um, what I think, I mean, irrespective of this um, RG picture, I think that the take home message here is that from this very simple modeling and the conspiracy of, of um, competition between the Goldstone modes and, and the tunneling principle, we end up with a phase diagram, which is actually quite remarkable. I mean, it, you have competing phases and non family liquid phases, plus the associated quantum criticality in, 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 in remarkable similarity to the I mean, raw structure of the phase diagrams you find for, say, cuprates or heavy fermion materials. So that, that's quite encouraging. I should say that such a simple phenomenological approach can go as far in, in, in predicting this. Um, usually, it, it's much much more difficult to, to um, get this type of phenomenology. I mean, starting from, from other model platforms. And um, we can now ask, what, what can we I mean, what, what, what can we do? I mean, um, going from here. And there are um, two directions I would like to mention. Um, here, here's essentially written what I just said. I mean, this um, um, aspect of, of competing correlated phases um, by phenomenology. Uh, the holy grail in this game would now, would be to, to become, I mean, to be more ambitious and actually include superconductivity. I mean, can, can we can we maybe um, uh, discuss unconventional forms or model unconventional forms of superconductivity in, in this um, kind of line of, of approach? And um, yeah, there are promising indications, but um, progress has been actually not so great so far. I mean, a few groups have tried. Um, there, there is a paper mentioned here, which goes in this direction. But um, this is definitely a direction which I think needs more activity and uh, more, more people to, to think about it. But so far, we haven't been able to explain the high temperature superconductivity, superconductor from here. Yeah? I mean, that would, of course, be uh, spectacular. Um, another um, line of activity is, um, which, which is, I mean, kind of nice, is to do um, nanoscopic quantum transport in this mindset, I mean, instead of thinking about whole networks, uh, one can, um, in this SYK approach, and a few, few groups have, have been doing that, as one reference mentioned there, and this reference contains other references, um, you can do, you can consider the following, um, a, a nanoscopic quantum system, I mean, think of a large molecule or a graphene flake or, or, or whatever, I mean, tunnel couples to deep. And um, in this case, we have a single SYK unit sitting here. And um, turns out that there are uh, qu quite remarkable or interesting predictions about quantum transport properties um, of the system following from this approach. But um, for lack of time, I, I just don't want to go there at this point. OK, so that was uh, essentially it. I mean, um, a, a brief um, discussion of how to do correlation physics. Um, with um, such type of approaches and the concepts that go in there. Um, so the, um, yeah, the, the, the brief upshot, I think I, I mentioned already is that um, it's relatively easy to get a lot of phenomenology or prediction from, from uh, simple modeling, but it would be just great to have, um, to, to go on in this direction and we need more activity. Okay, so that was essentially it. That concludes now our discussion of SYK physics at timescales polynomially in, in N. Um, good time to ask if there are any questions up to this point, anything that needs clarification? Yes, <coughs> I was just asking to stop for a pause for questions. Are there any questions maybe even in the chat? 
Sonst irgendwie. Ich habe nicht Chat. No, not even uh, not. No. Okay, you can ask it later anytime. But um, I would now, when, I mean, uh, really switch gears and turn um, open a, a new chapter. Okay. So I just do that. Um, what we will do now is we turn, <clears throat> um, we focus on physics at ultra long time scales. Time scales of the order of the many body. Of the, of the level spacing of the many body spectrum, in other words, time scales which are exponential in the, um, in the number of constituents and of the order of the dimension of the many body Hilbert space, uh, where we begin to probe yeah, structures at, at level spacing scales um, um, of, of a hard many body chaotic quantum system. And this regime is of interest essentially to two communities. Uh, first of all, there is a community of many body quantum chaos and um, related fields, including physics of many body localization um, phenomena, where one can say that, and I, I will try to argue on and show how this goes, the SYK model is, um, has become somewhat of a harmonic oscillator of the field. I mean, in, in generically, many body systems are way too complicated to be analyzed analytically at uh, such large time scales. I mean, it's just out of the question. You have to do numerics and numerics is difficult because um, dimensions grow exponentially in N. The SYK model is the only model, many body quantum chaotic model, which is to a large extent solvable and it's quite remarkable. I mean, so it's, it's a perfect test bed to compare analytic understanding of many body quantum chaos and uh, numerics and to test concepts, et cetera. And another community which is interested in this late time physics is the um, holographic community, where, I mean, somehow we have this duality to a, a gravitational background, including black hole physics, and we then really want to probe time scales where individual microstates um, become visible. Yeah, and um, there has been a, really a lot of research activity in the uh, particle string theory holography community in exploring this um, ultra long time limit. And I want to discuss aspects of that in the following. Um, so our starting point here, I mean, and, and for the time being now, I, I discuss generic chaotic systems, no reference to SYK. In, and I mean, I, I will ask by introducing a few concepts that enter the description of um, chaotic system, quantum systems in general at large time scales. And um, the center paradigm is the so-called Mohigas giannoni schmidt conjecture. I mentioned it in the beginning um, on, on Tuesday, which simply states the following. Um, suppose you have a, a, a complicated chaotic system, maybe a many body system as this one here and it, um, matching complicated Hamiltonian exponentially high dimensional. Um, it, this Hamiltonian, it, it, I mean, with emphasis on long time scales is described by uh, two things. Number one is the spectrum, and in particular, the fine structure of the spectrum, the spacing and the statistics, et cetera, of individual many body levels. And equally important, um, the statistics of its eigenfunction. And the Bohigas Giannoni Schmidt conjecture states that asymptotically, when you really focus on individual level spacing scales, the structure of um, the, the spectrum can be modeled by a super simple phenomenological approach, the random matrix approach, where you simply state that um, the statistics of the spectrum is equivalent to that of a high dimensional random matrix. And this random matrix um, has as high dimension as your many body Hamiltonian, exponentially high dimensional. Its matrix elements, H and M, are. IID distributed Gaussian variables. And um, the statement then is that the statistics of the spectrum of this Hamiltonian and that, they agree at the shortest time scales. And so does the relative statistics of wave functions. So the moments of wave functions, et cetera. So that's Bohigas, Shannon, Schmidt. And um, the, um, before testing now the validity of this conjecture, we, we should actually ask how, how do we characterize 
um, fine structures of uh, quantum spectra. I will focus on on the spectrum for the time being, not so much oh, on the wave function. Uh, yeah. I, uh, so like uh, you were mentioning that is there like really high dimensional like random matrix theory. Uh, and so like, isn't that really hard to compute um, because you have like maybe 10 to the 23 orders of elements and just, uh, I think it will, yes. be really, it will just so, like be uh, really difficult to compute, right? Yes, um, very good question. Um, keep it for a while. I will, um, I will in a sec, I will uh, show you numerics for SYK. And we, we, can, we can address this very question. I mean, how large can we go and how good is the comparison? Uh, but but the, 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 I mean, the other one answer is you can numerically test this for systems with N up to, I don't know what, 40 or so. That's, uh, that, that's state of the art. And uh, you then have to deal with two to the 40 dimensional matrices roughly. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, but but um, we will see. I mean, I, we will look at numerics in a second. Hmm? So um, how do we characterize? I mean, how, how do we actually encode the statistics of, of spectra? And I um, and, and many body chaotic or chaotic scales and quantum chaotic signatures in general. There are a few principles which enter this game. Um, you usually start from analyzing symmetries. <clears throat> I mean, so when, when talking about Hamiltonians in quantum mechanics, you have to, symmetries is something to watch out for. Um, and it turns out that where the classification of spectra is concerned, you have to distinguish between 10 fundamental symmetry classes, distinguishing Hamiltonians of different anti-unitary symmetries. Like, I don't know, symmetry under time reversal, charge conjugation, chiral symmetries, et cetera. There are 10 classes to distinguish. And I'm mentioning that because the SYK Hamiltonian uh, realizes eight of these 10. And um, what actually matters is the value of, and I'm, I'm just telling you this now, you cannot understand it from what I'm saying, I'm just telling you. The symmetries, fundamental symmetries of the Hamiltonian depend on the value of N modulo eight. So you have an eightfold periodicity, uh, say N equals 22, is in a different uh, symmetry class and n equals 23 and so on, yeah? Um, so um, what I will focus on now are values of n, I forgot which they are, I think 12 and 18 and so on, which are in the simplest of all symmetry classes, so-called class A in the jargon of the field, where the only symmetry you have of your many-body Hamiltonian is hermeticity. No other symmetries on top of that, just Hermitian Hamiltonian. Okay, so that was symmetries. Mentioning it here for completeness will not be so important in the following. The next um, signature you look at is usually the, the actual density of states of the system. Um, the, the number of levels you have on average um, in energy. And there's one thing to notice. Um, single particle chaotic systems tend to have um, a, a density which looks well, um, you, you have a certain spectrum as indicated here. I mean, you have a density of states nu as a function of energy. And normally, I mean, think of a condensed matter system or so you have something like a band, like here, I mean, the density of states in the middle of the band has some value. And at the edges of the spectrum, random systems tend to do that. You have a pretty hard spectral edge. That is generic for single particle chaotic systems, maybe with some small tails here. And that is, um, that is what RMT gives you. Random matrix Hamiltonians have a quite characteristic density of states, which actually assumes the form of a semicircle, the famous Wigner semicircle with hard edges. Now, many body chaotic systems are, are different. Um, their density of states, really the many body density of states turns out tends to be much softer. Um, it, and it's very often it's Gaussian, like this red curve here with extended tails. And for the SYK Hamiltonian in particular, we have discussed yesterday that the density of states down here close to the ground state actually has a square root cinch behavior. So it, it's quite different from that of a random matrix. And you might then argue, well, perhaps this random matrix approach is just nonsense, it doesn't work. But that is not so. Um, usually, 
we don't use random matrices to describe the actual many body density of states accurately. What we use them for is to describe fine structure statistical correlation on very, very small scales somewhere in the spectrum here and here and so on. And there, well, with regard to these questions, um, we will see the RMT approach actually works extremely well. Yeah? We'll see that in a second. So going beyond the mean density of states, how, how do we actually describe now correlations in spectra? And at, at, at the null level, what you need to know is that chaotic spectra, if, if you just take a computer and diagonalize um, some chaotic chemical, they look quite different from the spectra of integrable systems like harmonic oscillators, and et cetera. Um, the, the most um, important distinction being the phenomenon of level repulsion. So the spectra of or in eigens, the, the, the levels of chaotic systems are highly asocial as objects. They, they repel from each other. And the, the spectrum is in some sense stiff. I mean, like they, 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 they want to avoid each other. There are certainly no level crossings, which means that on the scale of the average level spacing, the spectrum looks like indicated here, different from the level spectrum of a typical integrable system where levels can become arbitrarily close. So somewhat counterintuitively, chaotic spectra look much more ordered than the spectra of integrable systems. And this kind of um, phenomenon, level repulsion, is then usually described in terms of certain statistical observables. The most prominent one being perhaps the so-called nearest neighbor spacing distribution. This is the following. Um, it's, a, it's a function P of S, probability, I mean, probability distribution, depending on energy divided by the mean level spacing times a factor of pi over two. And the difference now between chaotic and integrable systems is that the P of S for a chaotic system and, and for RMT looks as indicated here, it goes to zero for small values of S, which simply means you have vanishing probability to find close by levels, they don't exist. It is then peaked at the mean level spacing here, and then again goes to zero. For integrable systems, um, the probability to find close by levels is non-vanishing, including for very small spacing, and very often assumes the near Poissonian form as, as indicated here. So that's the P of S statistics. Another, I'm just mentioning, introducing these statistics because we will look at them in a second for SYK, right? So that's, um, bear with me. I mean, there's two more to come. The second statistical signature is the um, level level correlation function, R2 of S, it's often called, which is simply the, um, it should be epsilon here, which is simply the density of states density of state at a certain fixed energy E um, here, shifted by epsilon, multiplied by the density of state at E. So we correlate density of states differing in epsilon. We subtract, take accumulated average, we um, subtract the average value, and then compute it. And what comes out for RMT is this famous sine tunnel behavior. This R, um, goes to minus one for small values of epsilon, this should be epsilon, there are a few typos here, um, which simply indicates that for small epsilon, much smaller than level spacing, this cumulative, this average here vanishes. You will not find two level density, oh, you, you will not have density of states close by an energy, the level, this is again level repulsion. So what remains is a subtracted um, contribution. But then it is very likely to find um, two levels at spacing um, average delta. And that is this peak here. And this repeats them. And so this explains more or less the structure of this function. Um, this function here, um, energy dependent function, has a Fourier transform, which is a so called spectral form factor, K of tau, it is always called. And if you plot that form factor, oops, 
it looks as follows. In the unitary case, it has quite remarkable uh, shape. Um, tau is essentially um, is one is conjugate to one over s, and a tau of the order of one. This corresponds here to this um, uh, to this um, oscillatory pattern of the sine function. Um, you have a you have a you have a kink. And the uh, holography community got quite fond of this function and they introduced some names. They call this year the plateau. Um, and this year the ramp. Just, I mean, the details are not so important here. I just want to, to mention that there are these two correlation functions um, in energy and time. Here, this one, and they have characteristic structure, which essentially measures here this kind of. Um, uh, spectral rigidity. And finally, there is delta two of omega, which is the following. You take a certain um, interval omega, I mean, like um, here, a certain energy interval, and count how many levels do you have in it. And this um, number will differ from sample to sample, or um, will differ depending on where you are in energy. So there will be fluctuations. But it should be obvious that the fluctuations in the number of levels in the chaotic system are much smaller than in an integrable system, simply because the levels are so massively ordered, or so, so, so rigid. And that shows <clears throat> in this variance in the number of levels, which is called sigma 2, usually is, is only logarithmic in the width of your interval. For a Poissonian distributed, um, system, you would expect square root of n, an RMS of square root of n, and hence linearly increasing sigma 2 of omega. So something like, um, something like, I don't know, this here. But chaotic systems have these very low level uh, fluctuations and hence are only logarithmic. So upshot here, for generic chaotic systems, we want to distinguish between symmetries, um, average density of states, and um, various signatures of uh, spectral statistics. And let's now see how this uh, develops in the, for the SYK model. And what I will do now is um, I will switch gears. Um, I turn to slides and simply, I, I don't want to go faster, but simply there's so many pictures to show that um, it, it, it doesn't make sense to, to scribble on. So I will, um, Excuse me, Victor. Uh, Turn off the slide. Maybe any questions up to this point? Do you hear me? Nope. Yeah? Oh, yes. Uh, maybe this could be. <clears throat> Remember that it would be good to make a pause at some stage. I don't know if now, or maybe in five minutes or so. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, that's actually, uh, it's actually perfect that you mentioned it. We should make a pause now. Okay, very good. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, perfect. Are, are there, but still, questions? Maybe. If not, let's have a break. Okay. okay. No mm -hmm. questions. Okay. Then let us resume at uh, eleven o five. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Twelve minutes. Shall I? Yeah. Okay. I think I just started. Um, sharing screen, but this time. Yeah, you see, it should be a gray slide now. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so let me essentially, I mean, let, let me start on the slide and um, start by, by recapping a bit of what we had before, so the, the big picture. Um, remember, in the very beginning, oh, we mentioned this time scale timeline. And we, we, we should distinguish now four regimes, essentially, of, of qualitatively different. Um, time. Do you see my cursor here? Hmm? Yes. Ah, very good. So there is um, um, the, the super short time scale, smaller than n, where the dynamics is semi classical and we have operators scrambling and so on. Uh, a time scale is large compared to n. We have this collective quantum fluctuation. And then comes this large, large, large region of unknown. Dynamics essentially in between n and exponential in n. But if we go all the way to exponential in n, it gets simple again. 
So the, the working hypothesis is that for super long time scales, we should expect proximity to an RMT, um, random matrix um, Hamiltonian statistic. And um, genetically, if you have an, say, interesting chaotic system, no mind whether, never mind whether it's single particle or many body, um, you first diagnose that this checks that you have your RMT regime, but then you ask what happens if I make my go now to slightly shorter times, maybe still exponential in N, but um, no longer asymptotically large. And at some point we should see deviations, systematic deviations from RMT. And it is usually the physics of these deviations or their traces in the spectrum, which is an object of, of main interest. And I will illustrate what I mean by that in more concrete terms, um, both for the SYK Hamiltonian and um, for somewhat um, maybe more familiar case of a, of a disorder <coughs> of a dirty metal where we, can, where we can illustrate this type of uh, physics. So these are these um, uh, three, um, uh, I mean, three and four are now the, the, the regimes of interest. Uh, so brief recap, I mean, just to, to put this in perspective, what we had so far for short time scales where this, yeah, the scrambling and um, I mean, described by OTOX. And we had our um, Goldstone modes for the XTST in row six that at large. Um, and, and now we are really getting other uh, density of states again. Now, now we're really going to this long time. So here is numerics for, um, for the That's SYK question. Hamiltonian. Hmm? Was that a question? No, nobody asked, but okay. Numerics for <clears throat> the uh, different, the different spectral statistics I mentioned um, uh, before the break. So um, the first one is the nearest neighbor spacing distribution for the SYK Hamiltonian for different values of N, uh, 28, 34, and 36. For these values of N, the model is in different symmetry classes. Um, one is the unitary class, I mentioned just hermeticity, uh, and the second is the so-called symplectic class, never mind what it is, and it's a different class. And random matrix theory tells us that the statistics, um, the P of S statistics should be a little different in these cases. You see the black and the green lines, and you notice that the numerics sit on it almost perfectly. I mean, we have, we have wonderful agreement for um, Hilbert spaces of order two to the 36 or so. Um, down there, level number fluctuations, I mean, second panel, you again see quite good agreement um, between the solid lines and numerics for the same, more or less the same values of N. Now we have three symmetry classes realized, unitary, orthogonal, and symplectic. And on the bottom, we have the uh, spectral form factor, the Fourier transform of the two-point correlation function. And you see here that it's, it, it's actually, um, this is now by this, um, um, th th these are actually the, the, the principal groups working in this field, the Werbershot group, um, Stony Brook, and the Stanford group has been um, quite active there. Um, and um, this was here done for, from, mainly motivated by, by uh, holography. But anyway, it's, it's just um, the form factor and we have here this almost, but not quite perfect king. It's a, it's a little rounded, but it, it should be a perfect king for random matrix theory. But then we have here this prominent deviation from a king. And in the particle community, they dubbed this as um, plateau, ramp and the dip this minimum, which does not exist in random matrix theory. So that's a challenge explaining what's going on here. Now, let's now turn, I mean, just to focus a little bit and ask how good is the agreement with RMT actually? I mean, is it perfect or maybe not? And um, yes, we do have a good agreement with um, random matrix theory, but if we look closer, we see there are also deviations. I've already mentioned here the deviation in the form factor. This is <clears throat> um, a different numerical plot. 
where you have here this minimum, which is um, alien to RMT. But we also see um, deviations and prominent deviations in the number statistics. Remember, I said that the number statistics should be logarithmic. The blue line here is logarithmic. But quite irritatingly, we see that um, we actually have deviations in the SYK model. This is definitely no numerical junk. This is systematic. And, and, and we see that the number fluctuations increase actually dramatically, super linear. I mean, even stronger than Poissonian. So we have massive level number fluctuations for large um, level intervals. I mean, this L down here is the number of levels in your, in your monitoring interval. And there is a challenge to explain this. OK, so the upshot here is um, that we actually have an, an interesting situation, um, namely um, RMT fidelity checks at the longest time scale and smallest energy scales, but it's not perfect. And we, we are ambitious. We want to understand what are the physical principles be behind these um, deviations. Now, the first observation in going in our, or addressing these questions is to is to realize that we are actually not dealing in SYK with a simple Hamiltonian of Gaussian distributed matrix elements. Um, our Hamiltonian is a little more complicated. And let's now think about the Hamiltonian of the SYK model, not, not in a like in a, in a second quantized way of thinking, but rather in a first quantized um, mindset. So imagine your um, Hamiltonian is a big matrix, the many body Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian acts in a, in a Hilbert space, um, which is um, two to the, well, I mean, depending on your counting, n or two n dimensional. So what, what, I, what this figure here on the right is, that's actually a faithful representation of a two to the, um, um, two to the seven, uh, sites, occupation number sites, complex fermion occupation number sites of a, of a space of 14 Majorana fermions. So if you have 14 Majorana fermions, they correspond to seven complex fermions. The Majoranas are real and imaginary parts of complex fermions. And these fermions can be occupied or non-occupied. So you, that means that your Hilbert space has a dimension of two to the seven. Uh, 128. And what I have shown here is one particular site, um, arbitrarily chosen site, this 0001100 occupation number site. And the red lines indicate the partner sites connected to the site by the SYK Hamiltonian. Yeah, the SYK Hamiltonian is a, I mean, two body interaction. It connects certain sites in this many body Hilbert space. And it's actually a faithful representation for the real SYK Hamiltonian. And it teaches us the main signatures of our Hamiltonian matrix. Namely, we notice that the Hamiltonian acts in a lattice which has, I mean, there is no natural metric here, but it is somehow has a linear extension of order n. But it has a very high packing. It has two to the n sites crammed into this linear in n extension. And each site is connected to n to the four partner sites of the order of. Um, so that is a large number, but it is not exponentially large. So we have, we have a sparse matrix. The Hamiltonian is sparse. And it is, in some sense, long range and also massively correlated. I mean, it's not like we have statistically independent um, matrix elements in this seven dimensional, I mean, seven side system, we have only, <clears throat> um, we, we have only few, relatively few independent um, uh, random amplitudes, not exponentially many. So we have massive, massive correlations. It's not like we have IID disorder. So these deviations from our responsible indirectly responsible, or directly, I mean, we have to explain why, for the deviations in the statistics from the ideal random matrix um, uh, paradigm, yeah? And we want to understand this better. I mean, how, how, can, we, how can we make sense um, of all this? And um, in order to get closer to this question, I mean, 
to, to understanding, I mean, these correlations in Fox space, spectral fluctuation, um, it's good to first think about a much simpler but conceptually related situation. And we, let, let's switch total gears. I mean, let's switch gears and look at another chaotic system, which is much simpler, namely just a chunk of dirty metal. I mean, imagine you have a tiny piece of um, disordered metal, um, a fermion system, pre-fermion system with static disorder, and it's certainly chaotic. And let, let's ask ourselves, I mean, just qualitatively, what will we expect if we say um, inject a wave package into such a metal, or if we if we consider a density distortion and ask for its quantum mechanical um, uh, uh, dynamical behavior. So um, as time goes on, I mean, you, you just um, create a little density distortion somewhere, you start from a wave package. I mean, this wave package will spread and the, the spreading dynamics in a chaotic system is effectively irreversible. So it will be diffusive. Yeah? In, a, in a metal you diffuse both classically and quantum mechanically. And after a certain time scale, um, which is known as the Saulus time, that's a, I mean, a standard term in the field. Uh, your dynamics becomes ergodic. I mean, the wave package has now fully explored um, the, the metal. The metal is finite dimensional. And I mean, the density relaxes to a uniform profile. And from this point on, you don't see any spatial structures anymore. You don't see dimension. You see nothing, I mean, in the dynamics. The only thing you see is uh, symmetries. I mean, the, the metal will still know whether it's time reversal invariant or not, but nothing else. So on this basis, we um, identify this very long time regime beyond the Saulus time as a random matrix regime. And this kind of relaxational dynamics leading into it um, as the pre-Saulus time dynamics. And it's still chaotic and still universal to a large extent. In a metal, um, these relaxation modes, which describe the relaxation into this um, uniform background are diffusion modes. And the key question we want to ask is, is there an analog to diffusion modes in Fox space? So can, can we understand if there is something equally universal and relaxational going on in the Fox spaces? And we will use the SYK um, system as a, as a test um, rabbit to explore this question. Yeah, that's sort of the, where, where, where it's going. Okay, now in order to prepare, I mean, the answering this question or the understanding of this question, let me stay for a moment um, on this disordered metal um, metaphoric level and address the question of how we would describe relaxation or dynamics and the formation of a random matrix regime in, in a metallic system in the simpler context. And um, this goes as follows. Uh, we start from a good observable. And one observable to pick as out of the, the ones I mentioned earlier is the um, level level correlation function. I mean, rho of energy epsilon, rho is the density of state pair, epsilon plus omega over two um, compared to rho of epsilon minus omega over two, in, uh, uh, RE, I said. And E is somewhere in the spectrum, no matter where. And omega is very small, off the order of the level spacing, maybe somewhat larger. And delta is the average level spacing. So what this quantity does here in its cumulative average is it probes fluctuations in the density of states. And now we do quantum mechanics. We remember that the density of states is essentially the imaginary part of the retarded green function. I mean, one over E minus H. Hmm? And let's now for a moment think semi-classically. I mean, let, let's do semi-classic. So we think of the green function between two points in space, the propagator. We think of it as a sum of all Feynman amplitudes. And one of these Feynman amplitudes is shown here. So you start from a certain point, you propagate in your disordered medium. So think of this as a diffusive path and then return. You need to sum over all those paths and integrate over the starting point. And what you get is a density of states. Yeah, so far so good or, or question? No, okay, let me push on. So 
um, that would be one density of states. Now we want to know the product of density of states. So we need the second green function. Um, this now representing the second um, factor of rho. And we again have a sum over path. And all this takes place in this ordered medium. Now, quantum mechanically, in, in its propagation uh, through the medium, this is quasi particle amplitude, if you want. It picks up a random phase due to multiple scattering. So a complicated random phase is sampled along this path. And the same for the second green function. Now, once you average over anything, I mean, disorder or energy, these random phases will cancel unless the green functions propagate along more or less identical path. Yeah, so you, you, this is the essential step where disorder and chaos enters the game. And um, one can make this more, more, more quantitative um, as follows. You, you actually go a little bit more microscopic. You notice that there is scattering going on. So you have um, scattering processes described by maybe some random potential V of y, and y is a real space coordinate. And v is, uh, is say, correlated to the potential on statistically with the potential somewhere else. There is a dash missing here, according to some distribution function. And you then need to sum over all these, if you want, Feynman diagrams describing these multiple scattering processes. And in, in disordered systems physics, I mean, this machinery is developed. I, we don't have to go into any detail here. But conceptually, this is what hap what's happening. Now, now, now comes an important step, and it, it will be important later when we generalize the Fox space from here. Um, one important thing to notice, these scattering vertices in, in the native space, in real space, I mean, you, you have to sum over many of them, actually, infinite series of them. They're actually quite complicated. But what um, the, the progress in the quantitative understanding of these objects is made when you realize that there is a symmetry, there is a conservation law in the game. Namely, on average, um, the scattering, if you average over all scattering vertices in the end of the day, on average, it is translational invariant. And, and the, the formal statement is, think of an interaction, like what you know from your many body course on interaction physics. If you think in momentum space, so the particle amplitude of a certain momentum coming in, say P plus Q, Q over two and scattering of another one, um, P minus Q over two, this momentum difference between the two is conserved. That is simply the um, translational invariance on average over um, aver averaging over a random potential. Um, this is very important. I mean, the, the existence of a conserved quantum number in this game <clears throat> um, suggests that one should change from the real space, I mean, a description of these amplitudes in coordinate space, say X and Y, brass and cats here, to a moment, momentum space representation. And then we get a conserved quantum number in the game. And in this momentum language, um, the, we can actually straightforwardly compute um, see these kind of processes, these um, green function correlators. But um, on, on a meta level, conceptually, um, and th this is something I would like to, uh, you to remember for a sec, it pays to look at the situation um, in, in a basis change in operator space. Instead of working with brass, brass and cats corresponding to these guys here in, in real space, we should switch to momentum space, to another basis. And that will be important later when we do Fox space. Okay, now we are almost done with our metal analogy. Um, these multiple scattering amplitudes in momentum space can be computed by standard methods of many body theory. And each of these, if you want modes, is labeled by this conserved momentum Q. And we can uh, describe this by a little Feynman diagram diagrammatic code in this, I mean, wavy line language. And what, what do we need to know about these modes in, in order to compute spectral statistics and friends? Um, first of all, um, the, these, for a finite piece of metal, fi these modes are discrete. This is due to their momentum mode. So there is finite space um, momentum conservation in units of one over L. And second, each mode 
um, thinking of it as a function of q and omega has a certain eigenvalue, I mean, which we interpret as a decay constant of this mode. And this decay constant reads like dq squared plus i omega, and d is a diffusion constant. So what this tells us here is that this is simply the momentum space representation of the diffusion mode. And it reveals the physical meaning of these two green function modes as um, quantum descriptions of, yeah, of, of a diffusive relaxation process. So they, they describe the diffusive relaxation towards an ergodic uh, long time limit. And if you plug, I mean, um, all this in, I mean, if you, if you do the algebra and um, uh, actually um, represent this two green function object as a, as a product of two of these modes, two of these worms, you arrive at the following answer for the spectral two-point function and, and all related uh, statistics uh, following from it. So the, the, the two-point function R2 of omega is represented now as a sum of all these different relaxation modes. And we have two of them. I mean, one here and one here. So we have a, the, the eigenvalue a relaxation constant. We get it twice or product of these, I omega minus dq squared. And that's it, almost. Um, we notice that for the zero mode, q equals zero, um, there is a problem because if you put q equals zero, you have one over omega squared here. So you, you have a strong singularity. Now, what is q equals zero? q equals zero in the diffusion propagator is the ergodic mode. I mean, it, it knows, it in a way, q equals zero means integrating over space. So that's a totally ergodic background. And we interpret this q equals zero, this singular contribution, as a contribution of the random matrix. I mean, this is what where random matrix physics should sit. And to cut a long story short, uh, you need to regularize this one over omega squared singularity by, by summing over higher order modes. And um, there is a field theory sitting in the background and, and lots of things to be said. But in the end of the day, if you, if you resum, um, the series of, of um, infra, uh, infrared singular diagrams, you get the random matrix contribution. So in this way, the spectral two-point function is semi-classically explained as a sum of an ergodic random matrix mode and non-universal, I mean, well, non-ergodic, but still universal contributions, I mean, coming from diffusion modes in this case, which change the frequency dependence of this function for frequencies higher than a certain Thaulis frequency or the inverse of the Thaulis time, which in this case here is given by um, D over L squared, the diffusion time through the metal. That's exactly what we should expect for frequencies larger than the inverse diffusion time through the metal. The metal is no longer ag ergodic. It knows that, it, um, that there is a relaxation dynamics and um, we, we have not yet relaxed, and that's why we should expect deviations from random matrix theory, and this is the quantitative answer. And that is here, I was, is, is um, Altula and in 1986, um, dirty metal physics. So what I would like to do in, in the following now is, um, and I mean, I will not go into any detail, but I just want to explain the, the backbone of the approach is how to generalize this picture to Fox space and to the SYK setting. But before going there, uh, let me ask if there are any questions on what I said so far. I mean, I, I appreciate it's a lot of material and a lot of analogies. You cannot understand the details in real time. You need not, but at least the philosophy should be clear. So any questions or should I comment on something? No? Okay. Um, yeah, then let me um, now do the following. We now want simply, we want to play a similar game in Fox space. I mean, and um, I notice that this is actually quite an ambitious endeavor. I mean, um, it has never been possible before to do something quantitatively at, at this level of quantitative analysis, which I discussed. Um, previously for the metal, for, for a many-body system. So it's quite an ambitious project. 
And remarkably, the SYK model is just simply enough to make it possible. I mean, for SYK, you can, you can go quantitative and you can go do this analytically. And I want to outline how this is done. So we, we essentially play the same game as before. And um, by playing that, I mean that we think of the SYK Hamiltonian as a matrix. Uh, I, we had it before. And the, the leverage we have is actually the simplicity of the Majorana Clifford algebra defining the SYK Hamiltonian. And to explain what I mean by that, let's now look at our SYK Hamiltonian again. This is now, this Hamiltonian now assumes the role of the random potential I discussed before for the metric, right? So we have four Majorana operators, and um, to discuss this, I mean, uh, there is a short, shorthand notation here. Let me introduce this. Four tuple um, IJKL, order n to the four of them. We have a corresponding random coupling constant and the product of four Majoranas, which I call here XA. And now we, we draw a table which compares this SYK setting to the dirty metal setting we had before. So we can just, just to get oriented. Yeah? So both models are defined in Hilbert space for SYK. This is the Fox space of N over two complex fermions associated to N Majoranas. And for the dirty metal, this is function space. I mean, L2 space, I mean, wave functions in a D-dimensional system. Hilbert space dimension, here is two to the N over two, and, and here it's infinite. We have um, infinite dimensional function space. And in either case, we have a natural basis to start with. In a dirty metal context, this would be the position basis. And in the Fox space, this is the occupation number basis of our fermions. I mean, these binary words, um, two to the N over two of them. Now we have randomness, and that leads to a scattering vertices or defines two body scattering vertices um, in the, the metallic context is where these um, scattering of a real potential of, of um, wave function amplitudes are propagated if you want in real space with the correlation um, function psi maybe. And in Fox space, we do very much the same. I mean, we um, if we compute a green function Think perturbatively, we, we have many body Fox space occupation number states. They scatter of these operators. So these are just linear combinations of fermion creations and annihilation operators. They scatter into different states, and we do this many, many times. And the same, I mean, for an amplitude and for the complex conjugate of the amplitude. And appreciate that this is a super complicated object here. Yeah. I mean, you have no chance of getting this under control in general. Um, the kind of analog, I mean, to these position numbers, brass and cats here, I mentioned it, are N and M. I mean, Fox space state N and M. In the metallic context, um, we saw that it, it, the crucial step in making progress was to identify a conservation law or, or a basis in which the two-body scattering channel assumed a simple form, and that was the momentum basis. And now it comes, the, the crucial step in the Fox space context, context is that there is a similar basis, a basis change um, from this N and M brass and cats to a different basis in which this scattering process here becomes super simple. And that is, that is a key step, which actually allows us to make progress. Now, um, what is this basis? And let me first define it, and then I explain to you why, why the situation simplifies dramatically in this representation. And I appreciate, I mean, if you find it a little bit abstract, that's perfectly okay. It is a little bit abstract, but um, uh, it doesn't get any simpler. So hang on for a sec, and um, I, we will see what, what we can buy from, from this argument in, in, in a moment. So in think of this N, NM, brass and cats is a basis of matrices in Fox space, very much like this is the basis of matrices in real space. Yeah, it's just um, a basis, same here. Um, what's the dimension of this um, uh, matrix space? It's two to the N over two squared. 
right? I mean, uh, vector space dimension squared gives the dimension of a matrix space. So it's two to the n dimensional. We have two to the n linearly independent combinations of these guys. And now there is a different basis, again, a basis of Fox space, which you get as follows. You take all possible Majorana operators you have um, in all possible combinations and you build the products. Uh, so you take, say, the simplest of these operators is just zero Majorana, that's the unit operator. Then you have n um, uh, operators linear in Majoranas, or the n squared quadratic in Majoranas, etc. If you sum over all of them, I mean, over, the, over these Majorana monomials of order k, how many do you have to do the counting? It's two to the n. It's just um, simple combinatorics. Um, so there's two to the n, as many of the, as you have these linearly independent operators of this type. And that means that you can expand any matrix type object, either in this basis, I mean, think of this here as, as a two index matrix, or in this basis. And um, uh, my, my point is now that if you expand your scattering operators, instead of these guys in, in these bases, very much like you worked here in momentum space, um, you, you make progress. And let me give you just the argument why this basis is so much better uh, to work with. J just, I mean, the idea of this, yeah. Um, the point is, you see, if you, if you think of this here linearly expanded in this products of Majoranas, you then act always pairwise with these scattering operators and the same here and here and here and here and so on. Now observe that any product of Majoranas either commutes or anti-commutes with any other product of Majoranas. So that means that if you sandwich one of these products of Majoranas with different axes here, you get at most a sign change, but the operator in the middle does not change. So in this sense, it's a conserved, this is a um, defined uh, conserved mode. And if this is too cryptic for you, I mean, just forget about it. I mean, it's, um, it's just take face value that this is a good basis to work in. And um, uh, here's how it goes. I mean, this is now going towards result. So um, very much like you expanded here in or, or identified diffusion modes, each of these operators, which I defined before, <clears throat> these products of Majoranas defines now one conserved mode in Fox space. So it's the analog, Fox space analog of diffusion modes we are dealing with here. And they come with the relaxation constant instead of dq squared for the diffusion, you here get some function which depends on the properties of this operator you're working with, but actually not on all of it, but just on the number of Majoranas. So if you take, say, um, a, a product of five Majoranas, um, an operator x mu containing five Majoranas, its, its operator length is five. And um, the statement is there is a simple function depending only on this operator order, and we know it analytically. It, it essentially, for, for small Majorana words, it depends linearly on the length of these operators. Um, and that, that plays a role an analogous to the diffusion constant. And the scale entering here <coughs> is a many body level space. So that's basically it, um, end of this technical part. I mean, all we should do now is simply insert um, this result into our two green function formula for the spectral correlation function. And what we get in complete analogy to the metal is the sum of all these modes. We have altogether two to the n of them, but since the eigenvalues depend only on the operator length, um, we can organize them in combinatorial patterns. I mean, with n over k multiplicity, and we have here this characteristic two mode expression, and there is a zero mode um, corresponding to the unit operator. That's again, the ergodic operator, which knows about nothing. And that is the RMT, gives the RMT base level contribution. And that's the formula and epsilon of K is known. And now what we can do is we can simply test how good is it? And that we, we, we compare to numerics. So, um, that's what you see here. I mean, if we evaluate this formula and plug it in, we get for the number variance, we get the plots shown here on the right. And 
we can compare this to numerics and the comparison is good in the few percent. I mean, there are two or three percent deviations and there is not a single fit parameter here. So there is, there is a there is near perfect agreement of this um, formula with the observed numerics. And um, for the spectral form factor, we can play the same game. I mean, we just take the Fourier transform of our function and we get these functions here shown on the right and compare them to numerics. The comparison here is a little bit more hairy, but um, the semi-quantitatively, everything is, is, is all right. We get our dip and the dip um, is in, I should say, in very good agreement with what is numerically observed. So I, I think it's fair to say that this, this kind of Fox space diffusion mode picture, if you want, um, explains the SYK, um, observed SYK numerics beyond the random matrix limit. Um, right, so that was essentially where, where pretty much all, almost all of what, what, what I wanted to tell you. I mean, just a short appendix. I argued here semi-classically in terms of Feynman diagrams, but um, I just want to mention that there is actually a nonlinear SICA model, a quantum field theory sitting in the background. And remember, on Tuesday, very early, I mentioned that there was some, for large time scales, there was a, a symmetry breaking principle, causal symmetry breaking, and nonlinear SICA model reflecting this and so on. So that is the model we are discussing here. Um, these, these results I mentioned earlier, we get from this um, quantum field theoretical result, certain supersymmetric um, uh, field theory, which I, I cannot possibly explain, but let me just mention that this one has the symmetry breaking um, principle built in, which, which in a way encapsulates much of what I said before. And notice that there's a certain structural similarity to the G sigma action, but this is a totally different field theory here. And this field theory now works best for small values of omega means for large time scales. Yeah, so that's the second um, analytic theory we have in this SYK game. And just to illustrate how good it actually works, um, this is again numerics here. Yeah? And uh, for, for various values of n in different symmetry classes, and notice here we have these kings. Um, and it, depending on which symmetry class they are, these are actually not kings. Sometimes they are round for the orthogonal class and for the symplectic class, you have these little cusps. And um, look at these structures here. And you, you might think that this is maybe numerical dirt, but in fact, it's not. Um, so uh, this is here, um, these are analytic results um, for, for these um, three correlation functions obtained from the field theory. And this is deeply non-perturbative. I mean, there is um, really, this is um, beyond any perturbation theory. And um, the field theory does a very good job at explaining this. And this is actually many body physics, which we are seeing here. So um, I, with, with, really with room to spare, I don't know of any other many body system where you can play these games at this level of um, accuracy. Um, one thing, I don't want to overburden you, but one thing I, let me just briefly mention without explaining it, um, what is the physics of these Fox space diffusion modes? They are actually responsible for giving the many body density of say its Gaussian form rather than the semicircular form for single particle systems. Um, you can ask me if you, if you want to know more about this. Let me just mention it at this point. And um, finally, and more or less to conclude, um, this. Um, a uh, very long time game. Um, so I, the, the main message I would like to take you to, um, I would like you to take home is that the SYK model is actually a near perfect test bed for understanding the different facets of many body quantum chaos in a context which is just simple enough to be still solved. Of course, you, you do not get everything. Yeah, I mean, there are more complicated many body chaotic systems, which are beyond analytic reach, but this one here is. And I illustrated this on the aspect of spectral statistics. I mean, we looked at spectral fluctuations, but there's uh, many other things you can do. And there are a few papers are uh, uh, mentioned here. 
um, you can look at the really very, very interesting problem of many body wave functions in chaotic systems, how they look. Um, quite interesting and controversial field, in fact. Um, the SYK model can be generalized um, slightly by adding a two-body term, very much like what we did in this correlation, strong correlation um, section. And it then shows an MBL transition, many body localization transition. And this many body localization transition is analytically solvable. It's the only, tra only MBL transition which we have under uh, analytic control so far. And, and then there is this aspect of um, holographic quantum chaos where um, people are trying to connect manifestations of many body chaos in the SYK to manifestations of chaos in Yakif Tadelbaum gravity. Um, and friends in the bulk. And uh, much of the numerics I actually showed was done with this motivation by the Stanford group. Um, the late Polchinski was um, active there in, in Schenker and in Stanford. I mean, many um, people in holography. Um, and that's uh, where I'm concerned, one of the most fascinating aspects of this problem. I mean, trying to understand how to, how to, how to describe these structures, which we saw here, uh, from a bulk perspective, I mean, of, of, of holographic perspective. And it's, um, there has been, I mean, that would be for another day, but there has been um, impressive progress in this direction, but we are still far from an, from an answer. Um, okay, so that was more or less it. Actually, I, we did good in time. I mean, I'm, I covered almost all um, what I wanted to tell. Maybe before, um, before we leave, um, I want to show you one thing. Maybe I, I, I have some literature. Um, if you want to scribble this down, um, you can ask yourself, I mean, oops, I was um, um, necessarily selective in, in these lectures and covered what I personally find most interesting, but you can have very different opinions on that, of course. So here are uh, a few um, influential papers, which if you like this kind of physics, um, you, you may want to read or look into. Um, there, is a, there is a quite short review by um, Rosenhaus, who did uh, important contribution um, to the perturbative and large n mean field understanding of the SYK model is emphasizes here n to infinity physics, but has a nice wrap up of um, connections uh, in, in holography. Then um, <coughs> a really um, um, inspiring paper to look uh, in to look at, and it's early, right? I mean, it's only one year after the um, introduction of the SYK. So the SYK was introduced by Kitaev in two lecture, lectures, video online lectures, um, which of course are worth reading uh, and watching. Um, you can find them on the KITP website. He, he never bothered to write it down. And what Maldacena and Stanford then did is essentially they wrote down the Kitaev story, uh, but adding, adding their own insights. And this is an early paper. It reflects the chaos, not in the sense of quantum chaos, but the social chaos. Um, in the early stages of the of the field, it's a very inspiring read, um, and it it's it's mostly holography related. And um, and here's another interesting one. This is by um, uh, Kotler et al. I mean Polchinski collaborated there, and um, others is from the Stanford group, black holes and random metric theory, that draws this um, holographic um, RMT connection again early perspective. I mean, a lot of progress has been done since then, but it explains it very nicely why these models are interesting from, from a holographic perspective. And with that, I think I would like to stop. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, are there any questions? I would remind, I would like to remind to the students that Alexander will not participate in this afternoon discussion session. So you should profit now to ask questions, please. Actually, if, if, if there is something I, I should explain or discuss, we can, of course, we can, there's, it's electronic. I mean, we can schedule another Zoom, Zoom session, but um, only this today and tomorrow, I, I just can't. Mm -hmm.
probably talk too much and everybody is dead. And that's, no. Can I ask a question? No, of course. Um, so you said that the strange metal Fermi liquid crossover wasn't yes. a phase transition. Mm -hmm. Why, what, I just wanted to know what makes you say that. C come again, Jacob? Uh, so what, what is it if it's not a phase transition and how do you know? Whether it, 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 it oh, I mean, first of all, I mean, we, we do know that it's a second order phase transition. Okay. Um, from what actually, uh, now, yeah, I mean, first of all, the, well, I mean, the, 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 the um, standard reasoning is we have really two distinct phases, an indolator phase and a Fermi liquid phase, and they come with um, other parameters. They, you can take transport uh, coefficient, um, assume the role of, of other parameters there. And in the background, uh, we have um, the field theory. We have this uh, for each SYK grain, we have such a G sigma theory, and we then couple them um, to obtain a lattice G sigma theory, I mean, on a real space lattice. And we then actually play the same game as before. I mean, by mapping to long time scales where we have now a lattice of, I mean, a lattice Liouville action that sense in the background. And for that, um, we can simply do this, what, what means simpler, but we do the quantum stat Mac and we identify a phase transition and critical exponent, et cetera. Now at finite temperatures, um, well, that's essentially the standard logics of quantum phase transitions. We get then crossovers um, between these different regimes. It, it, it's quite abridged what I'm saying, but um, is it halfway clear? I mean, so are you just using the phrase crossover because it's at finite temperature and the actual things are quantum uh, zero uh, So some of the connections, not so can, can you repeat? Uh, uh, so you're saying that it's a crossover at finite temperature and- Yes, at finite temperatures you have a crossover. I mean, so there is this logic um, of, of, of quantum phase transitions. If you have a quantum zero temperature phase transition, you have this quantum critical dome on top of it. And um, that essentially follows from the fact that finite temperature is like um, uh, confining the time direction to, to a finite interval. And, um, it, it, it's absolutely, <laughs> it's absolutely standard in this um, uh, field of, of quantum phase conditions. I mean, there is nothing SYK specific there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Okay. If not, I don't flatter myself by thinking that everything was clear. I mean, I know that this was a massive amount of material, um, but perhaps I've made some of you curious. I mean, that would be the ambition. Oh. I think the level was fine. Well, yeah, what about me? <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions, let us thank Alexander again and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you yeah. very much, Alexander. Thanks for, for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being out for work.